Sing, Mike Ferrari. Yes, happy holidays. Happy holidays. You're off. You're enjoying what's likely a paid holiday. Mike and I <laughs> exactly. are grinding away uh, as we can to continue to bring you probably the most consistent triathlon podcast there is. And yes, you guessed it. This is the Crushing Iron Triathlon Podcast coming to you every Monday and Thursday. Today is Monday, May 28th. And it is, in fact, as we just said, it's Memorial Day. But hey, we don't rest, you don't rest, so we try to give you the most consistency that you probably have in your life. Uh, <laughs> including me. Let's, including me. Are you talking is, to me? Yeah. I mean, no. You, we, well, listen, man, you and I both know this is, you know, the most consistent you've ever been in anything in your entire life. Yeah. Uh, and probably me. It's got to well. be your top three, uh, that, for sure. It's, it's for sure. My, it's probably my top two. Um, I mean, come on. It's Memorial Day. I drove nine hours to get to this podcast <laughs> <laughs> just to make it happen. That's I am true. currently in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm uh, scouting out the Wisconsin bike course for everybody. No, I'm not doing that. I am in a different place uh, at my parents, actually. I just spent uh, about 20 minutes trying to get the acoustics right in my mom's arts and crafts storage room in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about glamour. I mean, the Man. glamour of triathlon podcasting, it just goes beyond me. I'm drinking a wow. warm Coke, warm flat Coke to hopefully get some energy to get through this. A warm, hey, but you know what? Those always taste golden uh, on the on the run course of really any race. Oh. And uh, I had a busy weekend myself. You all spent your Memorial Day weekend probably on the lake, kicking <laughs> back. <laughs> Having a few Coca-Cola classics or maybe even some brews. Enjoying yourself, shooting off fireworks, grilling with your buddies. And what were you we doing? Had, we had swim camp. <laughs> we had uh, swim camp. We had swim camp. We had an awesome time. An unbelievable group of athletes uh, in town, ready to work hard, overcoming anxiety, fear, uh, taking on new strokes and new challenges. And uh, we had a great session on Saturday, four and a half hours straight. And then we were back at it on Sunday morning, bright and early, for another three and a half hour session. And uh, man, they did incredible. And then I came back home and worked. So, uh, yeah, fun filled weekend. We had a great time. You missed it though yesterday, man. Like, you know, you, you know that when we usually show up at six, especially on a Sunday, even though it's Memorial Day weekend, it's usually pretty quiet. Yeah. Apparently, everybody else had the same idea. There was at least 60 swimmers out there yesterday morning. We're kidding. In, at um, six I'm in not, the morning? I'm not kidding. You, you, myself and two other coaches had to like convene to talk about where we were going to put everybody. Wow. Um, yeah, there That's was exciting, uh, kind of. Yeah, it was. It was fun. It was. It was actually great for the athletes to have that much stuff going on. And then you got you know a couple of rookies who swim the wrong way around the buoys, but that's yeah that's for a different oh, day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know the counterclockwise group, but <laughs> it was awesome. And in uh, in honestly, it's just really good to see so many people out there early getting their getting their swim on and getting some activity before the day's festivities. But yeah, it was a great weekend. And then today is Memorial Day. I had uh, an odd forty eight hours in that Allie and Hayden went down to. Um, her dad's house for um, the weekend it was his birthday and so they were hanging out and you'd think that you know man like 48 hours in a silent quiet house with like you know no kid and no wife like you're just gonna you're gonna have at it you know you're gonna lounge around and man i worked my rear end off yeah uh, uh yeah well and then saturday night i found myself singing santa claus is coming to town for 25 minutes on facetime uh to put hayden to sleep um, <laughs> that's yeah his, he, listen, man, he is a year-round Christmas guy, and at night he apparently, for at least for this small stretch, he is all about me singing. So, uh, the the even the the, I mean, not to mention just imagining me singing Santa Claus is coming to town is probably give you a little chuckle, but singing it on Facetime where the reception is so bad that I can only see my face because I can't see them. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, it was it was made for an interesting saturday night and then yesterday i got home and uh got my workouts in and uh then i worked till pretty till close to eight thirty, and then i watched a little bit of basketball and uh fell asleep 
and then woke up this morning to do it all over again. Yeah, can we talk about the LeBron James once again took over? I don't know if you saw the end, though. Probably not. I turned it off with three minutes left because I knew they weren't going to lose. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. He but, was... yeah, I did I did watch the, the majority of it. I had it on the whole time I was working. And, um, I mean, listen, we're never going to know who would, you know, there's going to be arguments for forever about about who's the greatest or whatever. But if you're a – and I used to be not, not anti-LeBron, but when he did his whole Cleveland to Miami thing, I was like, you know, it definitely – put me off but sometimes i forget how young of a kid he is he was at that point too but the way he acts with his kids and the dude is an absolute monster and you can argue with me if you want to but if he and jordan went one-on-one he would absolutely demolish him uh well i his i'm a, I'm a jordan guy through and through but i He's just he's too well, he's too big. I know, he's I know. I'm I'm gonna give you that. I, I, in fact, that's the kind of conclusion I came to. I feel like he is definitely more of a specimen, and he would probably beat Jordan one on one. But what I think he lacks is he's got a little condescension in him about his my guys, my guys this, and and I just don't feel like he gets the most out of his players. I'm not saying he's not a team guy, but I just felt like Jordan made players better, and that was to me the difference. He made Scottie Pippen, Scottie Pippen. And I have never really seen anybody other than Kyrie Irving uh, kind of bloom under his quote-unquote tutelage. And then he wanted out. So there's something going on there. I feel like he's got a little bit of look at me. Yeah, they, they said the same thing about Kobe, and he was decent. Yeah, but Kobe, you know, same thing. Yeah, I'm a Kobe fan, though. But, I mean, Jordan got guys like Paxson and Kurt. I mean, like, he just really made these guys better. I don't know. And I think he got in their heads a little bit. And to me, that's a big deal. Yeah. And in talking... supported kind of way, not a kind of like, I'm the man, do what the fuck, you know, whatever. Anyway, don't get well, me riled. It's, well, it's, uh, but, well, it's, well, it's funny because like now these players that he so-called made better are hopping on the LeBron James is better bandwagon. Oh, I think well. hadn't Scottie Pippen been saying it for like three or four years that he was better than he was already better than Jordan. No, he's never said that. Listen to the yes, yes he has. Listen to, and listen, listen to this stat. The last time LeBron James did not make an NBA Finals, seventy-eight percent of today's NBA players had yet to play a game in the NBA. Yeah, no, he's. I mean, that's insane. Now, given yeah, the Western Com- the Eastern Conference is the. Uh, is just insanely weak, but dude, listen, this honestly, uh, he's. I mean, if I, you're a Kobe guy, it's hard to be a LeBron guy, but the team he's got now is like the epitome of weak sauce. There's no um, doubt, but I mean, so are the just, Celtics. I, I just don't really see what's going on over there in the East. Well, they're Not two much. best. Yeah, well, we, we should probably just get back on topic. This could go <laughs> well, I thought this was topic. No. Uh, yeah, well, Jordan's been to six championship series and won six, and LeBron's been to like twenty and won one or no three, I guess. I think he's got. I think he's got three in there. Yeah, with a with a self manufactured All Star team, <laughs> and a, and a Draymond Green weak suspension that would have not let him win. That the was game. a pretty weak. That was a pretty weak suspension. But uh, I'm a Draymond so, fan. Anyway, I like LeBron. I think he's great. You know, I just he's pretty solid. But we figured today. Since we didn't finish last time, we would cover uh, the news and notes and uh, greatness from our athletes at Chattanooga seventy point three and the tips and advice that they had. Yeah, what uh, they, they learned. We, we, we barely got like halfway through. Yeah, I know we um, did last time. Oh, by the way, uh, we uh, do coaching, and we can find out all about that at crushingiron.com. Please go there and sign up for our newsletter. There's a little pop-up, an un- unobtrusive pop-up box. Unobtrusive <laughs> pop-up box. <laughs> <laughs> it's very subtle in the corner. It uh, is very Planned. And uh, all that sort of stuff. Join our closed Facebook group. Search Crushing Iron Group on Facebook. And, uh, again, coaching. Check, out, check it all out. we got the prices, everything on the website. Um, YouTube, follow us there for videos that I'm putting out more and more of and blogs yeah. and all kinds of Con- stuff like that. Content curator as of late. I mean, you're just like 
turn I'm focused, it. dude. I'm working right now you on are, a man. swim. I love it. Uh, the, men- the mentality of swimming video that uh, based on an interview I did with you, and then we're going to use some video from the camp. Ooh. So hopefully that'll be out in the next day or so. That sounds intense. I like it. It's not intense. It's just, it's you know, it's, it's a good way. To, it's kind of like the main thing to think about. And like you said, if you can get this your head wrapped around this concept, you, you sort of like start getting faster because of that. Very true. Um, so that's what I'm working on. Today we're going to go into the what people learned at the 70.3 Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got some more good stuff here. Um, are you ready to start? You got anything else to say about anything before we get into this? Uh, yeah. If you could send me that email again, I can't find it. Oh, okay. So I don't know, uh, where, I don't know where it went. While I'm doing that, I will see if but I. Yeah, can. if you, if you, <clears throat> yeah, if you have any or have any, we have a lot of inquiries. We always do when we have swim camps going or any kind of camp going on. But if you have any questions about the camps that we put on the swim or triathlon camps, you can find. There's a great. Uh, tab on the website crushingiron.com that goes over camps uh, gives you kind of the outline some testimonials and then a few videos as well so you can kind of see the the scenic backgrounds you're going to have access to when you participate in said camps and uh, then as uh, as Mike said if you have any from information on training plans or coaching options you can always uh, check out there as well and then definitely make sure you subscribe if you haven't already uh, on iTunes for our podcast, and if it tickles your fancy, leave us a review. Uh, we were at 174, I think, or 175 reviews uh, with the with the current five star rating. So we'd appreciate it if you wouldn't screw that up uh, <laughs> and uh, leave us leave us. But no, in all honesty, leave us uh, leave us a review like we deserve, and uh, we try to come back better than ever next time as we but have not based on the lebron jordan so yeah, yeah, yeah like, this yeah, is like a not, very yeah, small don't, don't be yeah don't be a hater um and you know don't don't judge a meal off off it being you know five minutes late to your to your table um but uh, yeah leave us a review let's know what you think it's, it's incredibly helpful for both mike and i and uh other people to find us and last but not least if you feel like it and you want to be part of a conversation and you're not much of a lurker and you like great advice, you can always find our group that is a podcast only group on Facebook. You can just search Crushing Iron Group. And there we are. And there we are. We're going to start with, uh, all right, once again, uh, our Crushing Iron C26 team uh, produced the second most points at the Ironman 70.3 Chattanooga as far as tri clubs go right behind the local group Chattanooga tri club so Mm -hmm. out of our athletes we asked them what they learned on that weekend and uh, we have the last podcast is the first half of that and the second will be this one so starting with Bobby Ritz I learned to stick to myself and my plan and not let those people who passed me on the bike earlier get in my head I saw a lot of them towards the end of the ride and then again on the run. Also, stuffing ice in my tri-top was a fantastic feeling. So, yes, that's one of your mantras. Let them go. Let them go. And let I think go a couple other... Let them go on the bike. I think a couple of other athletes mentioned that same thing, that they, the same athletes they saw crushing past them the first 10 to 20 were the same ones they came up behind the last 10. Um, and yes, it is. It's Listen, the bike is the hardest part of the entire race to run your own race and to stay patient because people come zooming past you, either going really fast on their own or in these obnoxious you know, Peloton style group rides that seem to be acceptable to some people. And it's just hard. It, it does. It's, it really gets in your head. I mean, rarely ever. I mean, I'd be interested to know if anybody's been on the run course and somebody comes blo- and you're just flying by and they're like, Oh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to hang on. I'm going to hang on to them. You just right. don't do it. No, you, you, n- n- you don't do it. You stick to your, you stick to your effort. You stick to your goals. You stick to know what you can do, but on the bike, it's just so lost. Uh, on people and Bobby, he did a, he did a great job of it. We mentioned him too. He was uh, he had only ran like three or four times in three months with a foot injury, and so he was uh, super patient and still and still ran well. Still ran the whole thirteen one, and um, 
and you know when you're patient you're going to have something left and and it, it was like i have i've had a bunch of athletes give me their race reports and you know one of the things that well, I, i'm not there most most of them just really aren't that sore they're not that beat up they're not that you know they're not wanting like two weeks off they're like back at it you know a day after and i've seen my race report yet have you? i know <laughs> No, I haven't. I haven't. But you know, it was. Uh, they just feel like they, you know, they've had to play things close to the vest because of how hot it was going to be, and uh, they still end up executing great races for the most part. But I think it's just a good overall lesson in in staying and staying patient the entire time, uh, and that it is uh, going to yield more than likely great benefits down the road. Um, but yeah, ice pretty much anywhere. Uh, when you are that hot and it is that toasty outside in your hands, down the back of your neck, in your hat, put your hat on. They're all great places to store ice and keep yourself cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I guess uh, Claire's got another idea for where to go ice can go. Yeah, Claire, uh, Claire said I learned that sports bras can hold an absurd amount of ice between aid stations. <laughs> I can't even. And that my bike saddle has to go. <laughs> um and then she says, but on a more serious note, I also learned that if things aren't going wonderfully, it's not the end of the world. I got kicked in the mouth on the swim, which I was a little bitter about until I was chatting with the girl in transition who was excited because she aver- she overcame her fear of water. She had almost drowned when she was eight. And yeah, I got humble real quick. Getting perspective back made the rest of the race better. Um, yes, uh, I do believe that the ladies have a little extra advantage with their ice pocket holders up top uh, and the sports bra. But hey, if you can fit them there, stuff them there and stuff as many, you know, uh, treat, you know, ladies, treat your tri top like you probably did your blouse in seventh grade and stuff them full of sponges. <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> it, and uh, listen, never, rule number one. Always take as much as you can with you, because in Su- and Chattanooga wasn't like this, but a lot of races are. Just because you get sponges that with that are ice cold at one aid station, don't make the assumption you're going to get them again. Because a lot of races that I've been to, and I think a lot of people have been to as well, is you'll grab sponges at one aid station, you'll rinse your face off, and then you'll toss them before you leave, um, and, or at the very very last, like you know, trash drop, and just assuming they're going to be at the other one. And then a lot of times you might get to the other one and guess what? There are no sponges. Uh, there's ice buckets, but they've ran out of sponges because people have taken them all, you know, ditched them along the way. So great piece of advice is once you, once you get some sponges, you know, get the, get the ice on them, keep them cool, rinse your face off, put them down your neck, uh, hold them in your hands, or if you don't want to hold them, just shove them in your tri top, zip it up, and hold on until you need them. Uh, uh, a, the cool water or ice cold feeling against your chest will help keep your core temp down. And then, obviously, if there's a little bit of moisture and coldness left in said sponges, once you make your way a quarter quarter mile down, half you know half a mile down, that way you're midway through the aid stations. You can always take them out of your top. Wipe your face, get a little ice cold water, and then put them back in there, and then dump them at the next one. But don't don't ever assume you're always going to get it at every aid station. Chattanooga was was spectacular in terms of its aid stations, and they had everything all the time. But don't don't guess or assume that you're going to uh, have that same opportunity at every aid station. Mm-hmm. And uh, how long was Claire's transition if she had that big conversation? I went off to go back to look. But. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was like, sounds like they got in a nice little new friend. Yeah, there. Had, yeah perspective was great. Yeah, it I is. mean, just no matter what, like having a really, really good perspective, whether it's training or racing, and especially when you know a lot of athletes, you know, went into went into the Chattanooga race with these really, really high expectations, and and you know thoughts about what they you know really, really thought was possible, and then when you know, even though you know many of them, not all of them, PR, they're st- they still feel a little bit was left on the table because of the heat, and you just got to have perspective. I did the best with what I could, with um, how I was feeling that day and what the day gave me, and mm-hmm. that's all. That's all you can ask for. You know, that's all you can ask for is to 
is to do the best you can with what you have and just kind of let the rest you know fall where it may and uh, always keep a good positive perspective and try to look at the big picture not just um you know the smear in the middle of the of the drawing Mm -hmm. uh okay next peter hamilton this guy i can't wait to hear what you say about this actually (laughs) i'm sure i learned more but two specific specific things stick out to me this was my first race with power on the bike. My first half, I let the power be my guide, but follow. Wait, first half, I let the power be a guide, but followed how I was feeling more. The second half, I became obsessed with hitting the range coach, and I talked about it. Became all I was worried about. I was so worried, I overbiked. It almost took over my thoughts on the run. Future races, I will trust my body more and keep the power as a guide. Um, and then the second thing is the run is going to hurt. It is all about managing the pain as long as possible. I kept telling myself to keep running, just make it another mile before you walk. I made it to mile 10 when I gave into the pain and walked up the hill. In the future, I want to push through and not give in. First off, <clears throat> Peter, a lot of us caved on that second loop at mile 10 going up that monstrous hill. So don't be, uh, don't beat yourself up too much about it. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, it was a booger. Uh, and then on to the first question is a great topic. Uh, I think uh, you so know, too. We, and we talked about this before on the, on another podcast. I think it was, you know, especially when racing, it's great to race. Uh, it's, it's always good to race with power, but you don't always have to race by power. And a lot of athletes, uh, and I, I kind of give a general rule of thumb as to, to my athletes. I give them a range. I give them average power. I give them normalized power for a race. And then I usually take off, you know, so let's say like, I, let's say I, I think that a safe zone for you is 200 for the whole ride. Well, I usually say, well, for at least the first 30, let's back off at least five watts. And to, to 195 and then if capital i f if you feel like you can push it more then push it and if not that's perfectly fine it's perfectly fine to stay controlled and just kind of let let yourself feel it out um i kind of had thankfully the reverse happened to me the first 20 miles in my ride i felt like garbage And I just made a point to like, I just, I couldn't even come close to hitting the target that I thought I was capable of. I was probably like 15 Watts below it. Um, and so I think it's just really, really important to listen to your body. Uh, and he, he honestly, after I looked at his file, he didn't really overbike that much. Um, maybe just a smidgen, but if it takes over your thoughts on the run and, and cause that, that's the only, that is the negative drawback. Because numbers are just numbers, you know, and we like we look at our power and 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 you know, a lot of this happens with athletes who um, train like almost exclusively on the trainer, and then they get outside and they see, you know, two hundred listen two hundred watts on the tr- on the trainer probably feels like two twenty outside. The the amount of effort you have to put forth outside just feels so much less. But if you go by it and think, oh, well, I'm biking too hard, I've got to slow down, well, then those numbers have gotten in your head. You always need to listen and, and feel out your body and be okay with it. You know, obsessing about hitting that range or then worried you overbiked. Well, what if you didn't overbike? What yeah. if you really feel great when you get off, but you kept telling yourself you overbiked? Well, then you're, then you're more than likely, you're not going to run your potential. Because you've already made up your mind that your that your legs are weaker than they probably already are, and then you so you basically run to the you you run the story you told yourself in T two, not writing your story along the thirteen point one, and that's what happens with a lot of athletes. They they make up their mind in trans in T two what their runtime is going to be mm-hmm. instead of just instead of just feeling it out and going with it and just letting letting their body tell them how fast or how slow or how hard they can really go uh our mind plays tricks on us and most oftentimes it slows us down but on the flip side it can also your mind can also speed you up you know if you're looking at things i i had my heart rate monitor with me on my ride on my on the bike because it was so hot i didn't want to get too 
too high and then i was running like the first like quarter mile and i looked down and it was like a very very high number and i said you know what this is just gonna f with my brain the entire the entire run so i just i uh i I, you know unzipped down to the deep v and (laughs) took off and took off my heart rate strap and tossed it over to two friends uh before i even made it like out of the view of transition just because i knew it was going to mess with my head i just wanted to let my body and my mind do the talking and not have to add anything else to kind of interpret how the day was going Mm, yeah well first of all i want to get a power meet i just i've been thinking i got to get one i just want to see you know i've never (laughs) had one and i want to see like if if my going by feel and my internal power meter how that lines up with a real power meter and just like Whatever. I was listening to this uh, uh, Navy SEAL talk the other day, and he was talking about attack mode, how they're always mm-hmm. in attack mode and everything like that. And I kind of resonate with that because uh, sometimes I feel like I hold back too much, or and I think that I have I'm capable more on the bike, and 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 then it just comes down to my run. If my run's in good shape, which it hasn't been, I don't think it. I don't really think it has much to do with my bike. I'm sure it has something, obviously, but. I just don't think I'm have my my run in in shape most of the time. But anyway, mm-hmm. it was just interesting because he had a he had a he said something. Yeah, we're usually we're always in attack mode or whatever. He goes, even when we retreat, we don't say we retreated. We say we attacked in reverse. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. But um, yeah. So uh, that's a it's a weird one, man. It's uh, I. Th- <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, that overbiking, I mean, obviously that's a huge deal, but, you know, it's just like, I don't know. It's a it's a fine line, of course, um, and do you get off the bike thinking too much about what just happened and, and, and let that affect the run? Mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder how often that happens, even. I wonder how often, you know, quote-unquote, cooking the bike is a mental thing uh, because you think you did or whatever at certain yep. points, and you can't suck it up and attack that final half of that run or whatever and that's sort of how i feel sometimes is i just feel like mentally i get a little bit too weak and you know you talk about like that could be nutrition stuff sometimes too yep Uh, if you screw up your nutrition if your you know blood sugar's low or whatever the you know the deal is um there's a lot of factors man that's why i was so impressive to hear you nail your nutrition yeah, that's it's it is it's one of the hardest things to nail, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just you know, it, telling yourself you didn't overbike, or to, you know, just it's just telling yourself, you know, like make you know, telling yourself a story when a lot of it's so left to be written. Um, you know, like and this might may or may not be the case, but you know, I'm sure one of the thoughts when you know Peter would thought about his first thought about walking was, yeah, well, I've probably got to walk because I know I overbiked. Hmm. You know, instead of, I wonder what the story would have been if his power meter died at, like, mile 30. And, ah, he, had yeah. no, and he had no idea what his power was. And he felt like he nailed it, so he felt like he was in perfect position to run. You know, the mind is just, it's just, it's a, the, I'm telling you, the, the mind-body connection is just a crazy thing. You know, and acceptance is, and this, and this is, like, way off subject, but, and this is, I'm sure this is, like, no scientific proof, but... I always can't help but think that, like, you, you see these people, and I, I know for a fact my my high school football coach, totally healthy, nothing wrong with them at all, uh, it's so it seemed, went into the doctor for, like, just a random checkup, uh, and he ended up having a, a brain tumor, and I think he died a week later. Oh, my goodness. And I, I, like, and you hear about stuff like that all the time. I know. And I just can't, I just can't help but think. Yes, you know, if he's got a brain tumor, is it going to kill him? Sure, it, it always does, more than likely. But I can't help but think, would he still have died a week later? I don't think so. I I, I, I think when you something bad like that happens, and it's like, like if he had never have known, I would, I would, I would get. I'm just guessing. I'm obviously not a not a doctor of any kind. Um, but I just I think there's something to it. Um, being told news like that, and then. Your like your mind body connection is just like you know so, so I just you know that's why I'm always like let's just not go to the doctor I just I just don't want to know um, <laughs> well, you, you know I mean. but I do I think there's a connection there but you know uh, but to the racing and like that's um, I know one of our athletes did um, Jesse Beanster who who had a spectacular race his power meter died at like mile ten mm-hmm. 
and he went on to fail and ended up just like running an insane half marathon. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I just think there's the mind body connection is, is pretty crazy. All right. Well, maybe I'm not getting a power meter then. He just talked me out of it, just that quick. I just talked you out of it, dude. I've been trying to talk you into it for like five years. I know, but you know, like what you're saying though makes a lot of sense. It's just like, I don't know. I think I could have. I, I, I raced about twenty point nine miles an hour on that bike course, and I think if I'd have went twenty three miles an hour, I could have still ran the same run I had. Well, so but but you'll never know. I'll never know because I'm always trying to play it safe. Listen, nothing wrong. N- n- yeah, nothing wrong with training with power and not racing with it. Yeah, there you go. Maybe that's what I'll do. Yeah, because that that it that allows you to train with more accuracy. A little more, yeah, much, a little more accuracy in a lot of areas, but that doesn't mean you have to race by it. Again, it goes back to that that statement: race with power, don't necessarily race by power. All right. Although. That's more. That's more so when the conditions are incredibly favorable. Um, you know, when they are like they were at Chattanooga. A lot of my athletes, you know, still are like, "Yeah, I feel like I played it, you know, r- pretty almost too safe on the bike." And then you're like, "But the run was what it was, so uh, that was tough." So yeah, but uh, lots of things to take from. It. And moving on, Sharon Cardona. I learned you can have a ton of fun doing a relay and push yourself as hard as you want in your leg and because your teammates can do the rest and you still get a cool medal out of it. And then I also learned that people like reading the name off my butt. Um, <laughs> lots of ways fun. You know, as long as you're not, you know, doing anything check shady. Out Sharon. Yeah, check out Sharon. The butt attention. Yeah, the butt attention is great. Um, but uh, congrats to her. She had an awesome bike leg. Uh, at Chattanooga, but yeah, I think relays are relays are just a, a great to add into the sport. It's a good way for get people into it, and she's already an accomplished triathlete, so not news to her. But uh, I think it's just a cool experience overall to get more participation. And and uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't I mean, honestly, I think it'd be kind of fun to do uh, sometime is to go out on like a fifty six mile ride and know that you can just like ride the hell out of it mm-hmm. and not have to run after yeah <laughs> you know i think that would be uh we maybe we'll get together to see a couple c26 relay teams for a race and and uh and do it that way but uh yeah great it's a it's a great thing and glad and she did great she enjoyed it and hey if you like your butt and you like your kit slap your name on it there you go tom stewart says i learned that 70.3s are this really interesting puzzle of power, speed, pace, and nutrition. Solving the puzzle specific to your body is the key to a successful race. I've got lots to learn. Mm-hmm. It's true, man. I mean, I think about like I think it's the hardest. Yeah, it could be. It's because it's got this weird thing now. It's like when I first started doing triathlon, I did a sprint and then I did an Olympic. And those are kind of like, you know, more or less all out if you can do it. And now I feel like 70.3 with everyone's experience and all the more we're learning about them and everything and the pros pushing those crazy numbers at the top. I feel like this crazy long race, which is a half Ironman, is turning into this sort of in more intense kind of Olympic. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of yeah, no, it's I, getting I, shorter. I, I 100% agree with you. I, I think it is uh, it is just under olympic effort Mm -hmm. for twice as long and the nutrition is totally different um you know olympics like you go you go like you know two hours 215 you can almost f up your nutrition but you don't even really need any on the run you need barely because by the time you're using the other you're already done but man on for a full it's a whole different story uh but yeah i do and i think that's why the mixture of, of doubling the distance from an Olympic and then adding the nutrition, but still, you know, trying to go really, really hard. It is, it is a, it's a fine line and it's, it's something that, that needs to, um, you know, be fine tuned. And, you know, it's just, it, it takes practice. And I think you're never, you know, you, you complete it and then you think you got another one and you're like, I'm going to push it, push it. Then you're like, ah, maybe I didn't push it enough. You know, the seventy point three distance is more or less where like you almost have to you almost have to fail at it once to really know how fast and how hard you can go. Because 
if the conditions are perfect on a 70.3, like there really shouldn't be any pacing on the half marathon. You should just be getting after it. Hmm. You know, you should start at like a seven or eight on a scale of one to 10 and then just hold on for dear life. But it, for, for me, it's basically like a, a zone four flirting with zone five at the end half marathon. And it feels in the end feels just like the end of an Olympic where you're just, you're just totally emptying and emptying and emptying the tank um, for as long as you possibly can. It's just, it's like a, it's like a torturous, like slow drip. And even, and even the bike, you know, you're pushing it, you know, you're pushing it, you know, not, not terribly hard, but the, but, but listen, if the conditions are perfect and it's flat, you're still pushing it. And it's just, it is, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard puzzle to figure out with, can I go faster? But then if I go faster, I probably can't take in as much nutrition. So how much can I get, how much can I really get away with? It's kind of, it's kind of the 70.3 to me. And then how much nutrition can I get away with? And then how hard and how high of an intensity level can I get away with for X amount of hours? Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a puzzle. It is. It's a puzzle. Speaking of puzzles, Tracy Shirley, things I've learned. <laughs> although every single, number one, although every single podcast mentions going too hard on the bike and being trash for the run, I probably kind of did that. <laughs> I'm going, <laughs> and I'm going to use this as an excuse to convince my husband I need a new power meter. There you go. Uh, number, number two, but I'm still way stronger and more capable than I thought, uh, which is awesome. Number That's three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is awesome. Uh, number three, going into a race with a time goal ruins everything. Uh, this was the first time I truly didn't have one, and I barely watched the clock because I didn't care. That's interesting. Uh, number five, it is, yeah. Number five, having my name in my ass is low-key annoying. <laughs> when I'm on the struggle bus and people want to talk to me, I hear you. Um Number six, I hate... Low-key annoying. That's yeah, over. Annoying. <laughs> yeah, whoa, shots fired. <laughs> Tracy, I don't know if you heard that, but Mike just called you low-key annoying. No, um, no uh, so her yeah, to say that. Nice cover-up. Right, the, right. The, anyway, number six, I hate Coke except during a 70.3 when it tastes like the nectar of the gods. And ain't that the truth? Um, and then seven, I get a backhanded, uh, low-key annoying compliment uh, my coach kind of sort of maybe just a little knows what he's doing. Um, <laughs> lots of good, lots of good content in there. Uh, as we talked about on one of the other questions, still super, super hard to not go all out on the bike and pace yourself. Uh, well, you've got too two. much energy there. I it was is. thinking about it's that. Hard. You come out of the water and you're, you've got like a ton of energy versus like you're saying on the run you, and the bike, you have to hold back a little bit almost yeah. in the beginning because you're, you're just charged up too hard. And yeah. And when you get you're to the run, you don't, you just, like you said, you can, it's all you can do to go seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah. You and can go uh, 10 on the bike real quick. Oh <laughs> yeah. Right out of transition. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it. Number two of my favorite, but I'm still way stronger and more capable than I thought. And that is a way with six Y's at the end, uh, which is always good. Uh, always great. That's, it's one of my favorite things to remind athletes of right before the race is, um, I promise you, you're so much more ready for this than you even like honestly believe. Um, you know, because it's just uh, I get I get to see the tree and I get to see the forest. You mm -hmm. know, as a coach and athletes, you know, which is one of the reasons, main reasons, athlete athletes get a coach. You know, it's because they can always see the tree, or they overcomplicate the forest and then they chop down a tree and then they plant a new one. But, but as a coach, it's great to be able to to have seen it and and help them plant their seeds and do this whole entire field and then harvest it for the race. You're like, you know, it's going to be great, but, uh, so it's always good to see. And then uh, I totally, you know, number three, going into a race with a time goal, everything. Um, and I, we've always said that, that, you know, Hey, I'll say it for the 1900th time. Expectations are just future resentments. And, uh, especially when it comes to the clock and especially when it comes to racing. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've had goals. Most of the races I've been, I've never hit them. You know, you just, and if you do, 
it's usually I mean, sometimes you you have a higher goal and sometimes you come in it's just there's something about that connection of being more relaxed at your goal that allows you to maybe go faster um it the, like mm-hmm. it's back to that mental thing again it's like you put these and i always talk about tri calc but you put those tri calc goals on your head and, and the next thing you know you're four minutes behind out of the water and that can really screw up the whole rest of your race if you're trying to think about how you have to compensate and you know rather than r- riding your race and hoping that the last <clears throat> five miles of that run you know become the difference mm-hmm. you might not have a shot at even doing those most of us don't yeah it's it is it's 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 a hard balance and, and the longer um and you know what? I think that's also why the seventy point three distance can be difficult mentally too. Is that an Ironman? Like it's such a long day, you just never know. Mm-hmm. You you could be on track on the bike and then totally fall apart on the run, or you could be totally totally behind on the bike, but still be able to run your best, and then you could chase down your goal because it's such a long day. You know, seventy. It is man. Seventy point three distance is like mistakes can be little mistakes become much bigger mistakes mm. in, in, in the, in the, in the scheme of the distance. And it is, it's just hard, but, um, Oh man, I skipped uh, number four where she said, I need to learn how to pee myself. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, Jesus. I thought you skipped that on purpose, man. No, dude, I, I, you do. Uh, I, you know, I'm a seasoned experienced triathlete and therefore I can, A, I can pee while swimming and not break stroke, which in my opinion is, is infinitely harder than being able to pee on the bike. Um, that took me a while to get, but I remember at Louisville that year, you and I did it when it was super hot. I think I peed on myself three times. In the- Big, Big mistake though, always the left shoe. Um, yeah, you, know, you kind of want to even out. But I, I have, I did find that swimming, like swimming and not breaking stroke and still and still uh, taking a leak, is really hard to do. Well, I think it helps relax you because you have to relax to do that. You know? I agree. So that's a good one. All right, let me skip away from that one for now. I want to go back <laughs> down to number seven, which she says my coach kind of, sort of, maybe just knows a little thing about what he's doing wait no, just knows a little about what he's doing yeah a little i just think i mean i just want to point out now you don't have to like you know relish in this or anything but I, you know <laughs> i think it's just impressive first of all you raced and hit the podium in your age group a tough age group and secondly you were coaching 27 athletes that day and 17 or 18 of which pr and the rest or close to the rest were first timers I mean, how do you balance that? I mean, I just want to throw a little shot. I think that needs a little attention. Uh, um, you know, I just want to—I don't want to let it go under the radar because it's a big deal. I mean, how you balance the—I mean, you don't have to go into it because we got some questions here, but maybe we can talk about that more later. But well, you know, I can, just no, congratulations I, on a big day. I, I, I will levels. say that it, it was—it was a—it was a good day, and um, you know, I will say that you know, I'm incredibly. You know, well, don't get me wrong. I do have a couple high maintenance athletes, but that's okay. They know who they are. But <laughs> for the most part, you know, triathlon triathletes get a hard, get a bad rap because they are, you know, quote unquote high maintenance or really, really needy. I, I'm incredibly fortunate. Um, I have a a boatload of athletes um, that are incredibly self sufficient, incredibly experienced, incredibly knowledgeable um, that aren't. And and that also like to plan, you know. I think one of the things that that helped me because I, I wasn't sure I was going to do either um, with with so much going on. And I think one of the things I got way ahead of of handing out the, the you know, overall game plan, which was like ten days out, and then individual race plans, and then you know, but they're just they're they're responsible, they're consistent, they work hard. Nobody was panicking, and they just you know, which which to which to me is a is kudos to them for the amount of work that they put in um most most oftentimes anxiety is stems from a feeling of being unprepared or just knowing that you are and uh i'm just again i'm just really really fortunate to to work with just a boatload of athletes with great personalities with um a great great perspective and head on their shoulders where they just they know what to do they come they work hard they be consistent and they 
you know, and so I think that uh, they definitely made it easier. But yeah, it was. It was one of those, you know, once every month weekends where everybody just, you know, freaking dominates. And so uh, kudos, uh, kudos right back at them for kind of sort of maybe just a little doing awesome. Uh, Robbie Krausen. I learned it's really hard to run and vomit at the same time. And forcing yourself from aid station to aid station works. Yeah, um, I can't personally comment on the vomit in the run part. I can't. Um, I, I can't. I'm sure it does suck. So um, he and I talked through that, and that we believe found the culprit um, was too heavy of a dose of a tailwind on the bike. Um, and but, and forcing yourself from aid station to aid station works. Went totally 100% agree. Um, I'm not going to walk. I'm going to make it to this next aid station. I'm going to make it to this next, you know, it's the same thing as not, not telling your, you know, just because you wake up and spill your coffee doesn't mean your whole day is ruined. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing as, as working and forcing yourself to go from aid station to aid station. It works. All I got to do is make it, it honestly, this, <laughs> this is the, this is what I tell myself. All right. I'm leaving the aid station. All right. I've already got less than a mile to go. <laughs> like I take like four steps from an A station. I'm like, all right, I already got less than a mile. I can do that for sure. I don't even like say that it's a mile because technically it's not. Um, or when I when I get to mile nine, oh, I've only got like three ish miles left to go. Uh, just because like taking off that last one like just mentally tells it to you. Or or when you get to like single digits and you're, you don't have ten left anymore. Yeah, it's just I think little I think little like we talked about you know like your mind and your body work in in sometimes mysterious ways and so i think that you know i just gotta make it to this next one and i do i tell myself all kinds of funny stories you know stories i'm like oh it's all it's just, so it's you know kind of like <laughs> we do in our podcast so basically <laughs> we have three million listeners and you know also when i get on the run course and i do i'm like i remember telling myself at mile nine I'm, i like went through the mile nine eight station and the first thing i said was all right pretty much only like two three miles to go Mm-hmm. It worked. <laughs> and it worked, you know, but it is. Aid station to aid station. Except on that hill. Except, except on that hill. <laughs> What'd you tell it, yourself there, bud? Oh, uh, listen, I, I don't I, did I tell this? Yeah, it's I okay. I told, it's all right. I, I, I think I, t I don't know if I told the story, but I'll definitely tell it. Uh, Renee Black and Shamika Pollard, two of our, uh, Renee's one of my athletes, and Shamika is a, a, a good, a good, solid friend of the cast, and they were actually both at swim camp this last week. Um, sent me a picture and said, "Hey, we, or we've got all these letters. What's what sign should we make?" And I just said, "Make it simple. Run, and then FFS for you know for fuck's sake." And uh, so, <laughs> so I am. I had no idea where it was. I didn't see it on the first on the first uh, run. And they had these station on like the big nasty hill at mile ten, and it hit mile ten. And I'm like, all right, I'm I'm making pretty strong. I want to have a good finish. I know I'm still in, or I think I'm still in fourth. I'm just gonna walk these last ten steps just to let my heart rate come down a little bit. And I mean, I took two steps, my first two walk steps of the entire half marathon. And then I look over and I see that damn sign. <laughs> and then you know what else I see? What? I, see I hear both Renee and Shamika yelling at me. I'm like. <laughs> Me. All I wanted was 10. That's all I wanted. 10 steps. How much is that to ask? And so, of course, I got back on my horse and settled up. But, um, <laughs> it, yeah, it didn't, it didn't work on that one. It mm. did not work on that one. Uh, Lucas Casterson says, I learned how it's funny when you hold back on the bike because coach says so, and then all those people pass you in the miles 1 to 10 show back up at miles 40 to 56. Same theme coming true. Mm -hmm. hold it back reel them in yep. let them go reel them in let them go reel yep. them in that's More a shirt let that is a shirt oh I like that that is a shirt alright moving um, on um, Courtney McGuire long car rides home the next day suck especially when you have to drive most of it <laughs> I know all about that Courtney mm. uh, not me I learned I, I learned, that's why I stay right. for like three days <laughs> mm -hmm. I learned I need more focus on nutrition and uh, then she asked, what was everybody's nutrition like on the bike? So, uh, yeah, the long car ride home the next day is the worst. Um, just It just doesn't feel good. Post-Texas, it sucked, I remember. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to go and tell everybody. I mean, in case everybody doesn't know, if you ever, like, Mike is one of those, you might think he, like, he kind of, like, plays like he doesn't know what's going on, or he doesn't play dumb. He just kind of can play, like, naive. Don't buy it. <laughs> so, like, we're, we're, we're I mean, I, we go Texas round trip, and I'm the one racing, and I probably drove 85% of the time. <laughs> And so we're on on the on the way down there, you know, like the twelve hours, we're trying to get ready to race. Where I, I do the first like seven hours, we get off the interstate. He's already upset because we didn't take like we didn't go through Baton Rouge, and uh, <laughs> I could feel I could feel like Google Maps resentment. And I was like, all right, your turn for a little bit. And we're cruising down a seventy mile an hour strip, and he's chilling at like fifty five. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm like, God, dude. Like, I'm like, you're killing me right now. I just want to get to our. I just want to get to Summer's house. Yeah, safely. Get a, get a, get a pizza. You know, uh, just get going. Here he is, like, you know, making side eye comments. These people like going way too fast when <laughs> they're going the speed limit. Yeah. And so finally, but we he made it like two hours, and finally, I was like, you know, what, man, let's just go and get some gas. I'll just take it from here. <laughs> Come it was on, a man. Perfect. Perfect ploy to not drive the rest of the way. Old habits die hard. You know, I, I got trained to drive on 55 mile an hour speed. And then, he, and then he also set a precedent for the return trip with the bug in my hair thinking, God, if we ever want to get home, I'm going to have to like make the whole thing. So here I go, drove us from Houston to Memphis <laughs> and gave him the last two. Or, yeah, so don't, don't, uh, but yeah, the car ride home the next day is a, is a booger. Um, it's just really, really difficult. Uh, so don't do it. And then, yeah, make sure you, you, you nail your nutrition. Don't let it go by the wayside. Uh, and always ask friends and confidants what they use so you can always sample and, uh, you know, go out and, and try it until it works. Cause listen, the, 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 one of the biggest parts of long distance racing, if not, if not, honestly, if not if the biggest part is nailing your nutrition. And once you've nailed it once, well, now it's just time to replicate it. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of triathlon's great mysteries is the nutrition, but uh, gotta nail it. Yeah, I think my nutrition on that drive home was a little off. That was the problem. Cheetos and whatever, mm-hmm. gas station snacks. Ross Kaffenberger, number one, racing with teammates and C twenty six colors rocks. I agree with that one hundred percent. Number two, no, Andy Potts does not get special treatment from shuttle bus driver when he asks to be let off before everyone else. I was with him. <laughs> that was hilarious, actually. Potts, uh, I think I kind of wrote about this somewhere, but we're on that little school bus, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, there's Andy Potts, and I'm wondering, why did the pros don't have like a little shuttle van or something like that? Well, he's riding over there, and we get up to the swim drop-off, and... You know, the bus ahead of us is unloading, but our bus is stopped right behind him. And Potts is probably thinking in his head, he's like, geez, you know, I, I go off first and I got to get in the, get ready and do some shit or whatever. So he gets up and talks to the young, young lady driving the bus. He's, <laughs> Can I get off now? And she's like, no, I have specific orders not to let anybody off this bus. Now get back in your seat. <laughs> and he mm-hmm. kind of like meekly walked back to the fourth row bus seat and just sat there like everybody else. <laughs> we were kind of laughing about it. Uh, number three, he says you can pee your wetsuit in line before the swim, and almost no one will notice. I did it twice. Yeah, that's a yeah. That's another. It's a, good. It's Man, a it just do. feels amazing. Okay, so number four, <laughs> without enforcement, people will draft the heck out of the bike course. Uh, I don't know if that means that uh, there was a lot of drafting, or there was. There was a lot of drafting, and then Ross. Uh, because pretty much all of you don't know who he is. Uh, although he does have an, a spectacular podcast. He was our first, I think, our first guest. Uh, I think it's in the 50s, maybe. Uh, an incredible, just He's an incredible guy. Uh, and so you look that up if you haven't listened to it yet. Um, but he's like six foot five. Mm. And so he makes, mm-hmm. you know, for mostly, most athletes are smaller. It's like the perfect person to draft behind because oh, okay. um, they get like no wind. Um, I, I in, in where I was at, I actually saw a lot of bikes until like the last five miles, but I saw a lot of uh, marshals. But yeah, it's a, uh, people are going to do it in every race, no matter what. Number five, Coke on the run works best when flat. Otherwise, get ready for a crampy run burps. It's about as pleasant as it sounds. 
Uh, <laughs> six, trusting your coach with a conservative game plan can produce a good race. We talked about that. Yeah, we did. And seven, I haven't reached my potential and can't wait to see what comes next. Yep. That's exciting. Very, very true. Yeah. He, uh, uh, and we did the mention this, like the pre Chattanooga podcast. We, that was, he was the athlete I was talking about, about, uh, going a little bit conservative on the game plan. He's still, he raced well. He PR Chattanooga, even with, uh, the conditions. And, but yeah, he's not even close to his potential yet. We've actually yet to, really really race a 70.3 together he did road through williamsburg i think last year was our first 70.3 together uh, and it was hilly and hot as crap and he was sick the whole week uh, and then this one was we played a little bit conservative um on the bike but with the heat and he still ran well so yeah he's he's got a lot of great things to come and be he'll be really really competitive in his age group mm-hmm. speaking of our next yeah, speaking contestant of, speaking of it yeah mark strasser uh, all good here. Quads are sore as an MFR. Number one, consistency and hard work in the winter will pay dividends. Two, I like running with no watch. Three, patience, patience, patience. And then four, post race, do a lot of walking. It helps the sore legs. Um, Veteran. Yeah. Coming. He's a vet. Mark is, uh, is a multiple time 70.3 uh, podium guy. He is a podium at Ironman Wisconsin this last year. He is a uh, he's a grizzly veteran um, with loads of potential. Um, we were just a couple minutes off just, I mean, just a few minutes off his 70.3 PR, which was actually back in 2013. So we are uh, in great early season form. Uh, but yeah, he's a guy that works hard and is consistent and it pays dividends. Uh, and I think his first, <laughs> his, uh, his first, ru- his first run, no watch was at probably not his first, but he ran last year at Wisconsin, no watch and ran his way onto the podium. So, um, yeah, he was one do- slot off this time. Yeah. And so, uh, his, we're in the, he's in my age group Yeah, and we're kind of getting up there, you know, we're at the top yeah. end of that, uh, age group scale, the old guys. And, uh, Eagle. Guys. It's funny because I, I the guy who won our age group did like a 420 <laughs> or something mm-hmm. like that. And I told Strasser yeah. that uh, we need to go down there and like uh, demand uh, uh, testing after these races. And he's like, ah, it is what it is. He, he was yeah. all, he didn't care. And I was just like, come on, man. Hey, 420, is- that's like depleting my desire to even do this sport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guy beat me yeah. by a damn hour. And, you know, it's yeah. not like. Is uh this this isn't the Chattanooga we want to be on the podium on anyway. So um All right. I'll take the full for it. And uh, how about this? We'll make this our last one. We're already gonna going over time here. Uh Kelly Powers, uh an athlete that I work with who just runs. I like this uh, one. Now. Yeah. She says, uh I did a she was this is about her marathon. Uh, not Chattanooga, just about a marathon. And she said, I did a caffeine fast for eight, eight days prior to Sunday and found that caffeine was a great reward to my system on race day. I also worked on taking in more nutrition. I basically doubled the amount of gels I take on the run. No stomach issues and almost perfectly even splits on the marathon. I feel like that helped me race closer to my peak pace. I'm excited to have figured out what works for me. And I'm ecstatic that Robbie's running workouts don't have all the long, boring runs I used to do, yet still produce great results. I don't think I'll ever look back on a 20-plus miler again, uh, unless I can get so fast that I log that many in 220. Um, at this point, I'm sore, and I've already lost a toenail. And uh, boo-hoo, because it's finally sandal season. Uh, and she again uh, reiterated the seven-hour car ride home after a marathon is not ideal. And no, no, it is not. Um, yeah, Kelly that same weekend qualified for Boston. Uh, hooray, hooray for for her. Which I do have to say, she, a, lot, a ton of credit goes to her. She uh, raced Boston, and as you know, you know, if you follow like even remotely anything about running, that. That was uh, what the second, uh, second or third Monday in April, and the weather was just atrocious. Um, and it, nobody, nobody. I mean, very few had stellar days. 
and uh, I remember she <laughs> she turned around and was asking me about I, w- I want to qualify for next year again. I'm like, all right, we got time. She's like, how about next month? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh Jesus! I'm like, is it the smartest idea anybody's ever come to me with? No. Um, attack! Attack! The- attack! Yeah, now is it the dumbest idea anybody's ever come to me with? Close, close, um, but but not all the way. And uh, so we actually, I mean, we only had four weeks in between marathons, um, and so uh, which is not ideal from a recovery and a peak standpoint. So we just had to be creative with with a few things and uh, uh, and you know go the way things you know just really she really had she was she's very good at listening to her body um and so we just got we got pretty creative and um you know it's nerve-wracking as a coach because you 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 know kind of like tracy said like you don't want to go in the race with time goals but if you're going for a bq and a boston qualified you you have to go in for a time goal it's either you qualify or you don't you know, and and so a lot of athletes look at that as as success and failure. And and she asked me the day before the race, um, and and this is the you know the same Sunday where we're in Chattanooga. She was like, you know, what do you think I can do? Like the worst question any coach ever gets, because you're like, how like somebody passed me a Kit Kat. I need to like you know, I need to not say anything back. Um, and I rarely do, to be honest. But I did. I told her, I said, perfect day, perfect run. You qualify for Boston. Which is nerve wracking because then if, if she doesn't, then you're then you, the athlete feels like they failed, um, you know, like they let you down or you thought I could do it and I just let you down and that's like the opposite of what any coach wants an athlete to feel uh, is that they because any coach will tell you this, at least they should, is that if they have athletes that they're never capable of letting the coach down. That's not how it works. Um, but I feel like she needed that actual reinforcement of you know you can do this even though you know the actual boss didn't go as way the way it did and you haven't done any i think her longest run was like 16 miles uh <laughs> leading up to it um mm-hmm. which is which is which is nerve-wracking i mean it's i'll be honest with you it's it's something that i struggle with with a lot of athletes when i start working with them is that especially the ones that just run you know that because you know it's the it's all running is totally different and running is totally different and and i gotta put in these 22 23 24 milers i gotta i gotta do this and i I have to do that and so um you know it takes a while and uh she finally um she bought in and uh but yeah that was i think her last yeah her longest run was 15.9 miles uh and that was before Boston. Then she ran Boston, ran the whole thing, didn't walk. And then in between Boston and the Cleveland Marathon, her long—I mean, because she already had the distance. We just worked on speed only. Her longest run was was under nine. Wow. And uh, she ended up qualifying for Boston with uh, I think six over six and a half minutes to spare. Wow, that's um, some food so, yeah. for thought, right there, fellas. Yeah, and it is, gentlemen and ladies. Yeah, I mean it's listen and, and it's it goes away. You can you can stack runs and uh, I had an athlete, Mark Bryce, who I um, mean listen, like, I'm not the only person that does this. It's not secret. It's just nobody likes to do it because it's not as flashy. But um, every once in a while, when I'm doing things, and we've talked about this on one of our early early podcasts, is I shot a text to my athlete Mark Bryce and said, "Hey man, nice job. 19 miles in 24 hours." Mm. And they and they were split up between three runs. He was like, "Oh, he's like, I see what you did there." <laughs> uh, and I was like, "Yeah, but you know, we just you don't think about it. You, you, everybody wants the 19 miler, but yeah, good luck getting in any quality sessions for the next five days." So yeah, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. There's a lot of ways to do great. But uh, kudos to her for honestly just having um, the moxie to not be afraid to get back out there having only run a marathon uh four weeks before (laughs) and uh recovering and going back and so huge props to her and all the other athletes uh, that we have that compete every weekend and uh always churn out solid very uh exciting results and props to you and me man for uh 
said props to me and you. <laughs> Turning out possibly our longest podcast ever on yeah, Memorial on Day. on a holiday. On yeah. a holiday. Well, you, you know that the Facebook closed group is cutting us some slack, but they're wanting to be like, hey, man, where the hell's the podcast today? <laughs> I know. Um, little do yeah. they know, we're working on our own know. little marathon. Yeah, we're doing – this is double overtime. This isn't even overtime overtime. So, um, But, yeah, we again, we appreciate you listening. Thanks for sticking around. We'll come to you again on Thursday. And uh, race hard, train safe, and have a good week. And stop by crushingiron.com. Preach. Preach it. Preach it. Uh, coaching. Uh, if you want to contribute to the podcast, if you're still hanging around, you must like something or whatever. But we have a uh, – pledge pledge button on the page and you can you know donate a little bit of something to the effort yeah and just as a heads up though if you do donate today on memorial day there is a auto uh time and a half fee because it is a holiday so if you uh pledge 25 you'll in fact be uh pledging like 42 so just as a heads up because you know it is double time time and a half for today <laughs> no <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> no don't wait till tomorrow do it today yeah do it today it's a, okay. it's all on the up um anyway coaching all that stuff crushing iron group on facebook don't forget to get in there and meet all these people get in we there had like 50 them. at chattanooga and it was amazing it was great and time more at and eagle man everybody, and everywhere everybody else. had a blast all right, buddy. Well, go enjoy your holiday while I uh, edit and uh, post uh, this podcast over the next few hours. Have fun, dude. All right. I'll see you later. See you.